have it recorded. Right, welcome everyone. Um, apologies for the technical hitches we've had at the start. I'm just here to introduce our guests and I'm going to ask them a few questions. Our theme today as part of our National Fertility Awareness Week is fertility education and we've got with us Professor Joyce Harper from University College London and Joyce is one of the founders of the Fertility Education Initiative and she also founded the International Fertility Education Initiative so she has a lot of experience around fertility education. We're also I hope going to be joined by two key members of Fertility Network UK staff who are involved in our fertility education project who will be telling you a bit more about their work and what they do. Um, Michelle who I think you can see on your screen as one of the Professor Joyce Harpers is um, the person who actually looks after our education project in Wales and Sarah Lindells Williams who I hope is going to be joining us in a minute is our Scotland coordinator. We are recording this webinar so you can watch it later and you can find it on the webinars page on our website if you've got any questions just pop them in the Q&A um, and don't worry we won't read out your name all questions are completely anonymous but do please put your questions in there um, Joyce I wanted to start by asking you really why do we need more fertility education well it's something that's never been taught in schools but we teach children or teenagers how not to get pregnant but we don't teach them how to get pregnant and how to have a healthy pregnancy and all the preconception issues that are involved with a healthy pregnancy. So we are seeing obviously global infertility and it seems to be increasing and people are having children much later. So the, um, the data around the world has shown that in almost every country, every year, the age that women and men have their first child is increasing. And in many countries, including the UK now, this is over age 30. And unfortunately, women's fertility declines in our 30s. So if we want to have two or three children, which um, my research has shown that most people do, then we're leaving a very tight window. So what we're seeing globally is that people are not having the family size that they, they want. We found that in a lot of European countries, for example, the total fertility rate, which is the average number of children a woman would have in that country, is around 1.3. So when I was young in the UK, it was 2.4. And now most EU countries is under two. And as I said, 1.3. So that means people are having roughly about one child. So we want people to have children if they, if they, if they want to have children. And again, in my research, um, when I asked this question, the majority of people, 80, 90% of people and young people, do want to have children. So we want to give them the information of how to do this, how to have a healthy child, so they don't miss the boat, so they can achieve this if they want to. So it's long, long overdue. We know that there's more um, about fertility in the curriculum now, isn't there? I mean, do you think there's enough? Is there enough now? Well, it's only one sentence. So there wasn't any sentences before. <laughs> um, now there's one sentence that says we need to uh, teach about fertility and preconception health and they've added menopause on the end so it's a very badly constructed sentence but it, the words are in there so I've spent the last few years going around lots of schools and uh, teaching about reproductive health and we've also run a survey in schools in the UK in Greece and in Belgium to ask young people what they're learning about and um, so, so at the moment obviously there's a lag phase there's not enough in there but what we're hoping to do with our International Fertility Education Initiative, we've made a PowerPoint presentation and a guide for teachers that will be freely available. It's almost ready. I've shared it with some teachers to get some feedback, but we want to give te um, teachers the, the tools to do this so that then they can deliver this themselves. But I, I remember about uh, five years ago, I went to my local school and with a list of topics I thought they should be teaching. And I said, which are you teaching? And she said, you're not going to be happy. We're not teaching really any of that. So there's a lot of work to do, a lot of work to do in the UK, but other countries are even more behind than us. So we've got to get those messages out there. It's amazing that some schools teach about things like genome editing and they don't teach about PCOS. Um, it's, it's just amazing. So we've got to get this reproductive health education um, rolled out now in schools as, as everywhere we can but obviously we're talking about the UK today so it's really important. That is extraordinary actually isn't it children learning about genome editing in schools but not about basic 
reproductive facts. I mean, what evidence is there in terms of actual sort of scientific research evidence that young people don't get the information they need? Well, our, our survey in the UK, we managed to um, get almost 1300 children, uh, teenagers. Uh, they were aged, they had to be 16 to 18 to fill in the survey. And we we asked that my long list of topics, we asked them what they'd learned in school. And interestingly, what they what are these which of these topics they'd looked for information outside school? And you know, there's a lot of topics there where they had actually gone and looked for like miscarriage and things like PCOS and endometriosis. So um we our data, we're just in, in preparation of um, publishing it. We published a very preliminary set of data in a paper where we looked at the English curriculum. Uh, we've looked at that in detail. We've got a paper submitted looking at the UK curriculum um, with our comments about how we can improve that. Um, and our colleagues in Belgium had almost 1,700 children fill, fill in the survey, and they've got very, very similar data to us. So, so we know it's not uh, being taught yet, as I said, they they were they were top marks for STIs, contraception, uh, puberty. They said yes, we learn that in schools, but they're not learning about the other important things that I'm sure all of us would agree that they they do need to learn. One thing that people sometimes say about teaching young people about this is that you could end up scaring them. I mean, is that a risk? Do you think, or do you think they're more sensible than that? Well, we, we are trying to be really careful. We're, we're really aware in our international fertility education initiative work that um, it is it is easy. This information is, um, you know, female fertility decline, for example, it's not a positive message. So we are aware that we can scare people. We can offend people by, um, you know, making them feel very anxious about their own fertility. So we're, we're doing a lot of work to see how we can do that, making sure our education is really fit for purpose. And uh, that there's, a, again, lots of work to be done. I feel that we're just sort of scraping the tip of the iceberg at the moment, but we're very aware that it's, it's easy to offend, it's easy to use the wrong language. And the top um, concern that young people had when we said to them, how can we improve things? The top thing they said was, we need to be LGBTQ plus inclusive. So they said their schools had not done that yet. And I, I know that things like contraception, they've given a very heteronormative uh, discussion around contraception. Um, and so that is the top thing that, that we've been working on. And, and I talk about that in schools and it's really well received. So we've got to work with our target group. We've got to work with teachers and young people and see how we can get these messages out in the most appropriate way with the correct language that doesn't offend or scare anybody. So from your perspective, what do you think those key messages are? So um, I start with the menstrual cycle and we're just about to embark on a big project around periods. Um, there's, there's not been a lot of research around um, how periods are affecting people's well-being, and that, it, that really needs to be done. And that includes non-binary people, trans men, perimenopausal women, all of them. So that's a large study that we're, we're just that's come out from my schoolwork, actually. Um, and talking about menstruation and the ovulation is something that they're all doing now. Uh, so it's it's really relevant to them. But then I think we do need to talk about um, male and female fertility, obviously, and the fact that even male fertility uh, is affected by age um, and then how to have a healthy pregnancy and how to get pregnant. So we I teach about the fertile window. Um, I don't do contraception because they've ticked that. They've said that's covered in school. Um, but um, I, I go into pregnancy miscarriage, understanding that miscarriage is more common than most people think. So if it happens to them, they're not totally unaware that this is something that unfortunately is relatively common. So giving them that information. And then I, I finish on the menopause. Um, so um, I have a very positive view of life post menopause, but I explain how being perimenopause is like puberty in reverse. Again, they're going through puberty, they're Mothers might be going through the menopause or their teachers, some of their teachers are definitely going through the men menopause and just hoping they understand um, what people are going through and that they, we can support each other going through this, uh, these stages of our lives. So and, and PCOS and endometriosis, absolutely uh, there as well.
I really like that idea of um, menopause being puberty in reverse. I have to say, <laughs> it's one of my lines. <laughs> <laughs> it, is, yeah. it, is, it is. I want. I wanted to move on to you now, Sarah, and just ask you a bit about the work that Fertility Network UK does in the education project in Scotland and, and when that started, really. Myself off mute. Um, so I would probably say that Fertility Network started to focus on education from around 200, 2012. So it's been about 10 years now. And basically what happened was, is that we received lots of calls and feedback from patients that we're supporting, especially patients who were 35 plus. And we've been given lots of information, of course, when they were young, but at school and how to not get pregnant and how they should ensure that they have their career settled and not to have a family until they're ready. So they kind of felt cheated really that they weren't given this information about the fertility health and how certain things matters especially with age and um, so that was something that uh, the charity was really keen to start work on and since that point really we've been fully funded by the Scottish government thankfully to go out with our education project in Scotland and try and speak to as many young people really as we can. And what's the aim of the project in so the aim of the project is really what we're trying to do is we're trying to provide basically better fertility information um, for young people um, on all aspects of their fertility, including how to take care of their fertility and how and when it declines. Um, so really we're trying to raise awareness among young people at university and colleges about fertility issues and to just really educate them about issues that can impact the fertility fertility such as sexually transmitted diseases and of course lifestyle choices and um, so really what we're trying to do is reduce the incidence of fertility problems um, as we get older by hopefully that you know when the young people are more aware of these issues that they have improved outcomes in terms of their sexual health and lifestyle so really we're trying to prevent the heartache of um, you know people having to go through fertility treatment because it is such a a really, really difficult journey to, to be on. Thanks. Um, Michelle, I wondered if you could tell us a bit about how the project works in Wales and how it's funded there. And I should say at this point, the reason we're talking to staff from Scotland and Wales is because that's, those are the two parts of the country where this project is funded. And unfortunately, it isn't in England. But Michelle, I wonder if you could tell us a bit about what's been going on in Wales. Well, the project in Wales is um, a lot younger than the project in Scotland and has only been going for a couple of years. Um, and um, we, we do similar activities to the project in Scotland, but we are funded differently. We're funded by the National Lottery. Um, so completely different reporting um, framework and also responsibilities, really. And um, we do reach out to freshers at Freshers Fairs, but we also try to reach out to all young people because we think that we, we need to get to everybody, really. So um, currently exploring young farmers clubs, for example, because Wales is a very strong farming community. And uh, I'm particularly keen on reaching out to young men. Um, and I think I'm going to find them down the gym probably or down Halford's car park with their cars and obviously that's that's difficult but the, these are the people that we we really want to reach because we've been quite shocked during our our first proper freshers autumn this year because of the pandemic quite shocked at how how little knowledge there is uh, out there about what will affect fertility and how people can look after their fertility so we had a great proper first year this year and um, want to build on that, obviously. But it's a, it's kind of all young people, but we actually want to reach all people because we think grandparents need to know about these things. And obviously parents need to know because we can all help to educate young people about how they can look after their fertility. So a pretty big task. Yeah. <laughs> Sarah, I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about the sort of work you do with young people. I mean, how do you get them interested in this kind of thing when you're at Freshers? Um, it, it can be difficult um, at times. You know, we do, we do appreciate the fact that, you know, they're young people, they're currently in further education and really starting a family 
is the last thing on their minds. And we do get that. We totally get that. Um, and also young people feel that they've made the decision that they don't want to have a family. Um, so really what our message is, it's one of empowerment and that's what we try and focus on and that's what we try and get across to young people is it's simply about empowerment, it's about knowing these particular eight factors that we talk about uh, and how important it is for, for young people to be aware of these factors. Um, some of the things we do to try and engage with students is we do have some games um, that we have. So this year we had um, pin the sperm on the egg game and that's quite a good way. It's a good icebreaker, it gets the students engaged. Um, previously, before the pandemic, we used to have um, like a beer goggle game. So there were beer goggles that we had um, and the students would wear and we'd get them to kind of pour a measure of drink as well, because that's another thing. Obviously, alcohol is a huge factor in fertility. Um, and we try and make young people aware of having good, healthy habits around alcohol. So we would ask them, for example, to pour a measure of drink, which they thought was a measure, when in fact, you know, when you're at home and you're drinking alcohol, the measures do tend to be that bit larger. So that's the kind of different ways that we try and engage with students. I mean, one of the things that I notice in doing the freshers, um, I've been doing the fresher events for about four years now, um, is that a lot of the men kind of step back as though it's not an issue that affects them, you know, it's not got anything to do with them because there's still that myth that it is a female issue, it's a woman's issue, um, it's not a male issue. So we're quite conscious of trying to get men engaged as well. Um, and that can be quite difficult, especially if you attend colleges where it's quite technical subjects um, where it's predominantly male who are students, that can be quite a difficult one um, to get students to engage with. But those are the kind of things um, that we do. And um, how do they respond? Do they engage with it? Yes, they do. I mean, what I've noticed this year, actually, I, I do kind of anecdotally, I pick up on things. Um, so, for example, this year we attended um, 37 events. So we're back to kind of pre pandemic levels because like everywhere else we were um you know we were greatly impacted by the pandemic because we weren't able to have our freshers events and um, so this year we managed to get back to those levels so we attended 37 events which is about two and a half thousand students we managed to engage with and there are kind of themes um, and I did notice more this year that there was more of a shock about smoking and how smoking can have an impact on your fertility health. Um, so yeah, there's definitely um, things that students are always quite surprised. And what's definitely in the theme is their lack of understanding and their lack of knowledge around fertility and how to protect it. Um, and why, especially when they're a student where you can, you know, they do tend to have unhealthier lifestyles um, when you're a student. And it's just to really be aware of those lifestyle choices for, you know, in the future. Michelle, do you do similar things with freshers in Wales? We do. Yes, we do. And it was interesting to note a real difference depending on what kind of institution we were at, because we went to FE colleges, um, which is 16 year olds who are right at the lowest end of what we're trying to reach, if you like, at the moment, because they're the youngest people we're allowed to interact with. And obviously right through to university students who could be any age, really. Um, but the students that were at the FE colleges, we, we had a, a lot more men than women interact with us, which I found really interesting. And the other thing that was very interesting is just like Sarah, we did pin the sperm on the egg, which can get quite competitive. And, and it was interesting to watch groups of lads see which one of them could get their sperm nearest to the egg, you know, and I know it sounds daft, but it really was an excellent icebreaker and enabled a lot of conversations around subjects that might not otherwise have been discussed. But it was very interesting that, that the boys were coming up, the boys were really interested. Um, as it went through the ages, as the students got older, it was much more equally spread and we would have very different conversations and have very different activities. For example, the last um, event that we attended was at Cardiff Medical School. So we had very able students that were right, right at the top of the tree, if you like. And um, so I took along a rubber uterus with me, 
which uh, I would bring out of my bag a bit like a white rabbit. But the, the interest in that was phenomenal because to show that to students and say, this is an actual life-size uterus and these are medical students um, was again, a great draw and uh, students were really, really interested in what we had to say. So yeah, freshers fairs, freshers fairs are great. And we really did have to learn a lot about what to do at what kind of fair. Um, and that's useful for us moving forwards. That's really interesting about the kind of different sorts of events and different sorts of students and how to interact differently. Sarah, apart from freshers, you know, what do you do in the fertility education project during the rest of the year? Are there other things you do with that? Yeah, so um, we also try and reach students, um, particularly students who will go on to work in the field um, around fertility. So, for example, um, midwife students, we do make a lot of connections with um, educational estab establishments across Scotland. So we can reach as many students as we can in the healthcare system. We also have a really active um, social media account. So we have Facebook, Instagram. TikTok and Twitter and we do a lot of um, work that way and um, we we make a lot of connections during pressure events so we make a lot of connections with other third sector and um, groups who ask us um, to perhaps speak to young people um, in colleges in particular classes that they have um, and other charities as well. And one of the things that we, we also, is, I should also mention that's really important is to dispel the many myths that are around fertility. Um, it's also a very good way to get students to engage with us because there's so many myths, um, especially ones that I've, I've, I feel have been generated really by social media. So for example, um, fertility is often seen now as quite disposable um, and it's something that you can think about later. So you know, there is a kind of um, point where people say, oh, I'll just get my, I'll just freeze my eggs, I'll just freeze my eggs, when actually they don't really understand what that means. So that's one of the myths that we talk about. We talk about even the initial costs of egg freezing. So a lot of people think that egg freezing costs are free when they're not. It's around three and a half thousand pounds. And then what they don't realise is that once they've, um, they've, they've went through an egg freezing and storage process is they've basically signed themselves up to IVF. And IVF, of course, costs around £5,000. Um, you know, and that's just for one round of IVF. And then the other important myth is that people um, have um, a lack of knowledge around IVF success rates. So everyone thinks that IVF is the solution. If you have fertility issues, I'll just have IVF and you know that that will be that, that problem fixed. When in fact, you know, the IVF success rates are around just over 30%, and that's when you're young and healthy. So, like the many women that we support across the UK, um, you know, if you're older, if you're in your late 30s, um, where you're of an age now where your fertility has declined or starting to decline then those chances of IVF being, you know, being successful is further reduced. So, you know, there are a lot of, as I say, there's a lot of myths out there um, and, and it's really important for us to kind of challenge those myths, put light on those myths and, and, and make people aware of the actual facts. Yeah, really important information that. Um, Michelle, in Wales, are you doing similar kinds of things during the rest of the year? Uh, yes, definitely. I'm, a, I'm about to start working with Abo University um, to work on the contribution we're going to make to their training courses for adult nursing. They, they actually approached us and asked us to take part in that because they want their future health care staff to be sympathetic and empathetic towards those going through a fertility journey and also in a position to advise young people as to how they can look after their future fertility should be um, context to be appropriate really so very exciting times for that definitely and um, something that we've just done which is not directly related to young people but more to do with educating the public at large about the emotional impact of infertility was our creative project that we ran with women currently going through a fertility journey and uh, the work produced from that is phenomenal and um, will be being shared uh, in the very near future 
I'm also working with Photo Gallery in Newport who want to show the work. And um, so we're going to get that a much wider audience that way. And the women that took part in the project found it very helpful to be, have an outlet for their feelings. What, what were they doing, Michelle? Could you just tell us a bit about what they actually did as part of the project? Yeah, we, we had creative writing and photography. So um, a fantastic poet called Dominic Williams, who is um, used to facilitating creative writing and, and getting people going really, um, took that side of the project. And I led the photographic side. So working on with women and how to share um, and capture and share images that they could take. And they only needed a phone to do it. So it was basically about getting the most out of what you had. Um, the women were encouraged to write um, in quite um, tight, technical formats um, that they'd never actually heard of before and neither had I and, and uh, very difficult stuff but they really rose to the challenge and enjoyed enjoyed it very much. That sounds brilliant thanks. Sarah I wondered if you could tell us a bit about the surveys you do because that's another important part of this work isn't it? Yeah so um, our the surveys that we've done this year so we are around about 2600 but we've still got some um, refreshers to do in January and February, which will probably bring those numbers up um, again. But, you know, just to give you an idea of um, the type of results we had. So the last time we had, of course, a full fresher events was in 19, 2019. So we surveyed around 2,200 students at that point and 72% indicated that they were not aware of the lifestyle factors um, that affect their um, future fertility so that's you know that's a huge huge amount of young people that have no understanding of the, or knowledge of their fertility health and you know just to kind of echo what Joyce was saying really you know we're kind of scraping the tip of the iceberg here um, even though we speak to thousands of students every year um, you know by not having this information in schools across the UK um, you know, schools are very good at talking about sexual health, consent, puberty, but our fertility health, it's a huge part of the jigsaw that's missing. Um, and it's just so important. I mean, I feel, you know, absolutely passionate that this should be a message that's shared in schools across, across the whole of the UK. Joyce, that's a pretty stark figure, isn't it, that three quarters of young people, and those are students as well, so sort of, you know, educated young people weren't aware of lifestyle factors. Does that surprise you or not really? No, unfortunately not. I mean, that that totally corresponds with our data of the teenagers at school. They they just didn't know any of these topics. Um, so it's it's something that, I mean, it's great now that the Department for Education has put the words fertility and reproductive health and menopause in the curriculum. Um, but it, this, these are topics that fall between biology and the sex and uh, uh, relationship health education. Well, they keep changing the names of it, you know, PSC, PSE or RS, uh, HE, et cetera. But um, I normally, when I've gone into schools, have given the talks under um, not, not in biology, but we've, we've done it in their relationships and sex education sessions. Um, so I think I think some of it does need to be in the biology curriculum, uh, the sort of nuts and bolts of it. Um, and then discussing those issues can be in the, um, the PSHE or RSHE, what they call it, um, uh, lesson. So we, we really need to work you know, holistically within schools and get this get this out there and pe people say oh young people aren't interested but they they are i'm sure sarah you're finding the same thing they are they are interested and if you ask them if they want children they do so we we need to do this there's no other way it's got to start at school and and you, you mentioned about social media we're doing some studies on social media and what's being put out there but as you said there's so much um false information and things that are leading them to um you know, myths that are coming out absolutely i i think we're spending our whole time debunking myths um <laughs> on the whole of the reproductive life course so yeah there's there's so there is so much to do and it i'm so jealous of scotland and wales i really am i've been following everything you've been doing and it's so so brilliant um and i think um you know 
it's it's absolutely it's a great start to get into universities but you know in England there's not even any funding so we, we'd love to work together and figure out how we can get some funding you know in Australia they funded this for over 10 years they've put a lot of money in reproductive health education fertility education and we are we are really far behind Sarah I wanted to ask you about the young people that you see I mean do you think when they leave you having come and talk to you at Freshers they are taking those important messages home with them yes I do I, I do really believe that um we have some really excellent conversations with young people you know they're really interested um with the information that we share with them um you know it's just it's just it's such an important message quite often as well young people speak to us and they're like oh I was an IVF baby or I've got an aunt who's really struggling or I've got a friend who was born via IVF so you know there is some understanding out there but it's just really about connecting the dots um and you know having this message not just available to universities and colleges but across schools as well um you know and and getting that message in early because I think just you know with young people it's at the it's at the back of their mind and what we really want to do is get this this message to the you know the front of people's minds really for the future that's a really interesting point about the IVF babies actually because as there are more and more IVF babies there are going to be more and more in every class at school and every university aren't there it's a very interesting point who will actually understand maybe slightly more Michelle I mean the project in Wales is a bit newer as you as you said at the start do you have you felt that you're really filling an important gap there definitely yes I mean as Sarah said, this information isn't isn't anywhere else. Uh, you know, it's coming from us. And sometimes the information that they want is is quite surprising. And I was just thinking of one young woman that comes to my mind that I met this time around, who actually wanted to donate her eggs. So she'd come to ask me where she could find out some more information about doing this. And um, I just think that that's such a lovely act. Obviously, she's a long way away from donating any eggs, but the queries are not always what you think they're going to be. Um, and some of the questions um, make you smile, uh, if not laugh. And uh, I, I'm not going to repeat them here, but they are quite interesting and uh, so, so rewarding to have to think about these things in outside the box, if you like. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about actually you getting sometimes some quite challenging questions as well. Oh, definitely, definitely. definitely. <laughs> I, I can actually, when I think back, I have I didn't see so much of it this year, but I remember a few years ago, I was challenged quite a few times about the age, the age factor, and you know, but everyone knows someone who's had a child, you know, in their forties, and I can say, well, I was that person, you know, I was forty-two when I had my second child, but. You know that was a that was a real struggle for me. That was after three years of trying and not able to get any help from a fertility clinic because um, the prognosis for conception was so poor. Um, so you know the age the age I think is a is a huge myth um, that we need to really work hard on, um, especially when we see celebrities um, who perhaps have children in their late forties, and you know I just. I just strongly suspect that we don't quite know what the full picture is behind that story. And, you know, obviously it's a private thing, it's a private matter, but um, I do suspect a lot of the times that they've had fertility treatment or used donor eggs, especially after the age of 45. And that's just something that's, you know, that they maybe perhaps don't want to talk about openly, that's fair enough, but it does give the kind of misconception that we can have a child up until you know, we stop having a period um, because just because we have a period doesn't necessarily mean that we're still fertile when we're 48. So it's I just think that's so important as well. That's very interesting I, I, you say that. I was just reading a thing the other day about someone having a child in their 50s and the article mentioned the fact that they'd used donor sperm but didn't say anything about the eggs. And I thought, well, that's quite interesting, isn't it? Michelle, do you see that sometimes? Do you get challenged on age as well? Uh, I think the surprise is about fertility falling off. Um, lots of the young women that I speak to uh, have, have want to have a really high powered career. And, you know, they, they just it's something they think, well, I'll think about it at some point in the future because I'll be all right for ages because 
um, you know, so and so had a baby when she was fifty something, so it's it's not an issue. I can I can do what I like, or I can freeze my eggs. I'll just freeze my eggs, you know. And it's important to bring a note of reality to their thoughts. I think it just it, it, and it's very hard because, as I said, this is a it's a very negative message, and we've had certainly some issues with with women who aren't you know thirty five forty who have got very upset by being told this information. I think maybe, I don't know if they maybe did know and sort of were in denial, but I think I think we do need to be careful how we tell young people this. It, it is a very depressing bit of news that they don't want to hear. They do want to have this career. And, you know, we, we have so, young people have so many more opportunities now of travel and, you know, the, the world's their oyster and, you know, 30 is the new 20 and, you know, every, everything's sort of being pushed pushed back. Um, and so to be told that, well, actually, you really should start to think about having a family when you're in your late 20s, early 30s, is, is not, not a nice message to have to tell people. So it's it's really tricky. But I totally agree. Sarah, everything you said, I say exactly the same. It is the celebrities stories and it's but but it is causing issues when they, you know, there, there seems to be more and more coming through late 40s, early 50s. And there, there are some people out there who say that female fertility decline is not real. And it's just the patriarchy who are trying to pin us to the kitchen sink and that making us all go and have babies when we're at the peak of our career. So that those things still happen. So um, I think we're in a, a difficult situation. It's true. And I think the sad thing for us at Fertility Network is we see the other side of that. We see the people who then wish they'd been trying earlier and I think that's often really hard I, was, I meant to say if anyone's got any questions do just pop them in the Q&A Sarah I wanted to ask you do you feel that you, with your the work you're doing do you actually get the sense that it is making a difference for the future for these young people yeah I do um I, I, I definitely do because I do get lots of positive feedback um you know that they'll take that on board and they didn't realize you know that smoking had an impact or alcohol had an impact and they will be mindful and I also had quite a, a long conversation with a young person um this year and, and she was she said that she's really really worried about her fertility because she, she knew that her mum had went through a lot of difficulties and she says it is an anxious thing at the back of her mind and her friends think that she's crazy for worrying about this when she's only in her early 20s but um you know we don't want to cause alarm but yes um definitely the people that we speak to the I do feel that they take the message on board and that's certainly the feedback we get from questionnaires but um we need to speak to more young people Michelle do you have a similar sense of, of young people going away better informed in Wales oh, oh definitely and and I, I'm a strong believer in knowledge is power you know some some of those facts might be unpalatable but I think it's important to to have them to be told them and then it's up to you what you do with them we're not telling anyone what to do we're just saying these are the facts uh go away and carry on you know um but but you, at least you're not going to get to a point in the future where you say i wish i'd known that when i was younger because we've told you there are still women going to ivf units and saying why did nobody tell me this mm -hmm. and that you know that's that's just not acceptable we we've all got to get out there and and it's just <laughs> great that you know, we've got people like you who are out there doing that. So it's just fabulous. We are starting to make a little dent in that uh, iceberg. <laughs> I've got someone requesting the names of the people here um, because they obviously weren't here at the beginning. So we've got Joyce Harper, who's smiling there with the dark hair and waving, who is Professor Joyce Harper from UCL. Our other person labelled as Professor Joyce Harper with the beautiful trees behind her is actually Michelle Wright, who um, looks after our education project in Wales. And at the bottom with her name actually very efficiently there is Sarah Lindors Williams from Fertility Network Scotland, who's our Scotland coordinator. We've got an interesting question from someone who's asked what you're doing to reach young people in social media so um can i i'll start on that so our international fertility education initiative we've got a, a network of people um we're just embarking on a study <clears throat> looking at social media um and what sort of information has been put out there around fertility education to try and see if it's correct um what's having an impact um I've got I've got a house full of teenage boys, all IVF, by the way. I had my 
twins at 42 after many years, seven years of uh, treatment and, and the other one's IVF as well. But um, they, they told me we have to go, have to be on TikTok. And I, I have done a couple of facility education videos on TikTok, but um, I, I'm, I'm quite old. So I find it really, <laughs> it's, it goes against the grain. I think we have to use social media. Um, and I think our first, our first step is finding out what's actually being put out there and what's right and uh, what's not so right and what works. So it's uh, something where I'm sure we're all looking at trying to... You use it quite a bit, I think, in Scotland, don't you? Yeah. So um, we've always had Facebook and Twitter accounts, and that's with the charity as well as our project. Um, and more recently, in the past 12 months, we've also created Instagram and TikTok accounts. Um, in Scotland, we're lucky that we've got two educational officers who work very hard across our social media channels and trying to promote that. We try and promote these channels as well during events at pressures and other events. But we don't have the number of followers that we would like. We would like a lot more followers. So if you can go on our social medias um, and give us a like and a follow, we have Facebook, Twitter, Instagram and TikTok. And of course... Um, today is Fertility Education Day, so we've got lots of new videos and information um, on our social medias because I've, I've been basically posting that all day today, so please have a look. And we've also got um, a section on our website about our education programme as well. And next year we're, we're going to start looking at books as well, like the books that Joyce Harper has. Um, Professor Adam Balin as well. We're going to put some of our books on as well for further reading um, if people would care to do so. And Sarah, where would people find those? What are they listed as? Are they listed as your future fertility or? Um, oh, goodness. Is it fertility future or future fertility? They've all got the four have got the same um, username. We just made it nice and simple. Um, so right. that and they'll find them I'm sure and we've got another interesting question here which I think is probably one for you actually Joyce and as someone who wanted to know whether you've looked at what information is being shared on uh, period tracking apps yes actually one of my uh, past students who helped me work on this Roshi is actually um, attending so hi I wanted to say hi to her um, yeah we we have looked at period tracker apps and we've looked at fertility apps um, we've asked people that use these apps how they feel about them um <clears throat> i think most of the things around a period tracker app seem okay um there's a few little things that niggle me one in particular um is that the period tracker apps that um are just looking at calendar you know just looking at your dates uh they tell they tell the user that the, the day they ovulate um i think this is very very dangerous and we published a paper a few years ago now looking at six, over 600,000 menstrual cycles. And we found that ovulation, this was an app that was using basal body temperature. And the, um, we found that the, the, uh, the information from the apps was that their um, ovulation was closer to day 16. And some other groups also did big data studies and found the same thing. So we've, we've got to have a, have a look at that in more detail. But um i so i, I think telling telling especially younger lots of young girls use the apps and they're super fertile and if they think oh i've i've it's day 14 my apps told me i've ovulated i can have unprotected sex um they, there's a hard, high chance of getting pregnant so when i go into schools i ask them if they use a period tracker app um and we have a chat about it and i say say to them that you're super fertile uh please please don't ever rely on this app as a as a method of contraception and don't think oh it's told me i've ovulated i can have unprotected sex so that's one of the that's the first key message um that i tell them so i i think that's something that is a bit sad about the apps and also we're, we're not algorithms we're humans and so the apps don't always get the period date right obviously um and we have looked at how women have felt if their period was earlier or later and it does cause some anxiety. They think that something's wrong and that, um, you know, they, they must be infertile and all, all sorts of things. So I think I think apps have a place, but I think we need some more education about how best to use them and their limitations. Sarah, does it come up ever when you're talking to young people, when you're talking to students? Sorry? Does, does the subject of period 
tracking apps come up when you're talking to young people ever well not no, really um no not about the tracking apps um we do get questions about um menstrual health and we just generally signpost in those instances because um our project does um touch upon a lot of kind of issues um around health we you know our role really within within those queries is just to kind of signpost we do work really closely with um, other charities, especially Endometriosis UK and um, PCOS as well. So, but no, personally, I've not had any questions about um, using menstrual apps. I think we're probably coming to the end of our time. Um, we've got a list there of all of those, um, very usefully, all of the TikTok and Twitter and Instagram and Facebooks and everything which people can have a look at and follow and do please follow them and like them I think Sarah and Michelle will both be very grateful if you are able to do that but I wanted to thank um, all of our brilliant guests this evening it's been really interesting to talk to Joyce Michelle and Sarah about fertility education and to find out about you know there's so much brilliant work going on but there's always so much more to do isn't there and I think that's the very difficult thing when it comes to fertility education but thank you everyone for joining us just a quick Quick reminder that we are a charity and everything we offer is free of charge but we're very grateful to anyone who does feel able to make a small donation and you can do it now by texting so it's super easy so if you wanted to donate three pounds you could do that by texting FNUK3 to 70085 for a one-off donation and you can make any amount of your choice by just texting FNUK and the amount and then to 70085 so thank you very much to anyone who feels able to do that but thank you most of all to our brilliant panelists this evening to Sarah to Michelle and to Joyce it's been really lovely to talk to you in such an interesting conversation and thank you to our audience for joining us as well we've got one final um, webinar this week as part of our National Fertility Awareness Week which is tomorrow and we're going to be looking at some of the barriers to treatment with Stuart Lavery who's a consultant in reproductive medicine so that promises to be very interesting if you'd like to join us that's at 12 o'clock lunchtime tomorrow but good evening everyone and have a good rest of the evening and thanks for joining us.